Sure. Um, well, what I suggest, and um, alternatives welcome, is I say a very few words about me. Um, and then, believe it or not, there's no slides. So, but what I have done, thanks to John's inspiration, is written up a case study. Um, and then we can go through it and have a general discussion around the case study to get an overview um, and then go into our groups and dive into it in more detail. What do you think? Works for me. I know you, I, great. <laughs> I know you're still in shock because there's no slides. <laughs> and I can always make one if someone's, you know, getting PowerPoint withdrawal symptoms. <laughs> But otherwise, um, I'll start with a few words about me um, so that you know who this strange creature is with this funny accent and also who you're talking to. So, um, so I'm currently based in Sheffield in the UK. I was in Switzerland for approximately 20 years in two shifts and I've also traveled a lot internationally. So, and worked in co mostly in global companies, in telecoms, I spent time at Ernst & Young. Um, focus on healthcare, and then also financial services. So, and then went independent approximately four years ago. And it's all, I, what I've also done is served on a couple of boards, uh, one of which is my latest role as their CFO and head of finance. I guess it's always been important for me to have some sort of, to have, do something to do with bringing knowledge forward, if that makes sense. And also, you know, my civil and corporate responsibilities. So good works. So, and um so finance was my first career because um, I did work experience at a third world development charity and then found I could do this stuff and was actually enjoyed it and really interested. And that led me to do um, a master's in finance. Um, so part time as well as working, which was quite an achievement. Um, and then pretty well, as soon as I, I got this thing, I got promoted into internal auditing. So I was in the finance space for about, I had a finance career path for about 10 years, took some time to travel, um, and then was promoted into, into internal auditing, which took me to Switzerland. And then I was spotted as part of a group of um, business professionals and promoted into HR. Um, working on big organization development and change projects. So I like to think that I've, I've got an idea of business I can bring in um, the performance side and also I, I know something about people. So, but learning all the time. And this, um, so the business case was uh, inspired by John and also yourselves because um, what I've, I've always been interested with knowledge management because everything we we are we are knowledge workers and we acquire knowledge through our university education through our life experience um, from each other um, and then particularly we sell it. So it's our collateral and, and to a certain extent, it's part of our value and we're expected to somehow deliver on it. And what I became fascinated with is particularly amongst um, having worked um, and done projects with IT professionals and IT communities, there's very much an emphasis on the system and the process. Um, but our system and the process are only as good as the company that it's that they're housed in or that they're they're being hosted by and also the company that's chosen them so and that company is only as good or as successful as its um, commercial and operating environment and and we we hear VUCA so often I mean it's got a, a diff yeah it's a four-letter word um, and I'm not sure and um, certainly in my culture if we refer to a four-letter word it's usually insulting um, and I think we've heard VUCA so often, 
that um, it's almost the eye roll starts and here we go again. But it's, it's still incredibly relevant. And I thought what would be an interesting contrast to the really um, useful and helpful discussions we've had is to explore um, the trials and, and tribulations of a company and, and to have a look at the challenges posed by a company's commercial and operating environment and then um, have a discussion ask as risk management uh, knowledge and risk management professionals to to see what kind of solutions knowledge management could provide because i also think that knowledge management isn't as well understood as it could be and as a consequence its value isn't always um, recognized beyond the system and the process that i mentioned earlier Okay. So any questions, comments? Well, I like to think that you're stunned um, because you're so delighted, as well as being stunned because there's no PowerPoint. So I'll give um, a quick, I'll talk for another couple of minutes, okay, to give some some background into into this case study and then um then let's have a look at it is that all right brilliant so this was actually a company i worked at and i'd um so they're a very big international financial services company uh with approximately i mean it varies but approximately fifty thousand people and then armies of consultants, outsourced service providers, um, and so on. And there's three main hubs, which are New York, uh, London, although that may change with Brexit, so more volatility and more complexity. And then um, a Western European hub, and also Hong Kong. So, and the service lines are varied, but it's bro broadly around, um, high net worth individuals, investment banking, asset management. Um, and amongst these, the presence in, in most of the big financial markets, they've got various offshore tax havens. And they've had a very long and illustrious history since about 1850. So, but particularly since 2008, there's been one scandal after another. So I think there's also a couple of implications there for knowledge management, because one is the, the kind of corporate history. All right, there's, there isn't going to be anybody in the workforce who's been around since 1858, but certainly in its Western European hub, whole families were in the workplace. And it was somewhere that was really seen as, well, my grandfather was there, my father was there, my mother was there, that's how they met. So, so that's where I need to go and work. Um, and so you've got the accumulated knowledge that way, but then also one, but then also um, you've got the financial crisis of 2008 and what that means for what, for how relevant knowledge is and what people need to know going forwards. So, um, and then also because it's been affected by a number of successive scandals, well, what kind of knowledge is not being retained because otherwise, why would they be getting into trouble again and again? Okay, so a couple of things to think about. So what I'll do if it's all right is um, if I can share the case study, have I got sharing rights? No, you don't. Let's see. Can I have them? Hopefully. I can do screen. You know, I should, if you're the host, John, and there's a little shield next to the participants icon, click on that. Sure. Everybody can share now. Now, were you thinking, did you want to just post a document in chat, Hillary, or were you going to actually share your screen? Share screen. I can share my screen. Sure. Is that so, all right? Yeah. So you can share a screen. And let me also make you co-host in case that adds any extra. Hours. There you go. Right. Can everybody see that? Shall I make it bigger? It's a little small. A little yeah, small. being it bigger. I'll make it bigger.
So how's that? Is that okay? Yeah, a little better. You'll have to do the scrolling for us. No problem. So this is Big Bank Inc. So, and as mentioned, it's a very long established international financial services company um, with principal hubs in the US, Switzerland and Hong Kong and offshore tax havens. So, and there's been a lot of problems since 2008. So compared to their rivals, they were worse affected. Um, there's been scandals since, including executive remuneration, extensive trading losses, and also fines for non-compliance. Not to mention other things like um, few rogue traders. So GDPR, so global data protection breaches where data, the wrong things happen to, to customer data um, and others too numerous to mention. And um, this is based on somewhere I used to work. So, and I went in um, to do a turnaround project and turned up at the end of 2008 at the heart of the financial crisis. So let's just say it was an interesting time. So, um, so in terms of history, they would grown like mad from their humble origins um, as a local and then a national bank way back in 1858. And, um, but when they bought something, it was pretty well left alone. So, um, so no economies of scale um, and also fair amount of duplication, which is the other side of the autonomy that people are allowed to operate with. They were actually a te technology pioneer and they did invest significantly in the big, usually Oracle based um, transaction processing systems. So, but dependence on consultants and contractors rather than building their own capability. And that reflected what was happening in the wider market at the time. So one of the pro again, one of the problems of being a pioneer is to a certain extent, you're being hijacked by your dependence on a very few who know what the company needs them to know. So, and also what you got was a patchwork of solutions and a very fragmented, system, fragmented systems landscape, um, which, which became more complicated over, over time because of the, the number of workarounds. And it got to the point where there, were, there was more code written for workarounds than there was for the system itself. So, and then big banks got approximately 50,000 employees and very long service. And also they, pride, they used to pride themselves on coming in girl to woman sometimes, um, boy to man, and you've got whole families in there. And there were different signs of success, um, and one sign of success as well as um, receiving um, con lots of promotions was also you got promoted overseas. Um, and so, but what they found is that the populate, the workforce was getting older and older. So again, back to the subject of lots of knowledge, but how relevant is it? And although there, there was still interest in the graduate programme, many of the people, especially those with tech capability, were looking to go and join startups or the challenger banks. Okay. Um, and they experimented with outsourcing, but they hadn't done the kind of business process re-engineering first. So, so a lot of that, a lot of the outsourcing centres were set up, but then nobody used them because they tried to found their own workarounds. Um, and also what happened, unfortunately, is the outsourcing centers were set up. They weren't getting enough business or the jobs were too complicated. And then everybody working there left. So what you got were disjointed processes um, and also significant attrition. So, so a new executive team came in and they set strategic objectives and really demanding ones. 
So, and these objectives were diffused to all different parts of the organization. So to regain their place as a top 20 financial services company, improve revenues, um, radically reduce their cost base, move towards digital, um, build internal capability, particularly with data science and analytics. Um, massive culture change, massive. Um, and then also reduce headcount attrition to 30% below labour market average. So, but here's the fun bit. These are the challenges. So economic difficulties and social unrest. I mean, we've read the news about uh, what's happening in Hong Kong. Um, and this was and, and all the problems pre-COVID and this has not helped either. Um, very slow research and development pipeline. Um, and they also were investigated a few times because of uh, links to former dictators and despots, um, particularly in Switzerland. I can say that because it's been public news. So, um, and the other offshore tax havens, TBD. So compliance and regulatory issues, um, burnout, um, which has been reported in, also in the business and the people press and sadly rising rates of death in service. And some of that is, is related to age, but inevitably to work related stress. Um, and then also loss of trust by investors and customers. So any questions, comments, Well, you're either stunned with excitement because you can't wait to get into this challenge or you're in a state of shock because it's big. Um, one, one question I have is, is this um, more or less a, a hypothetical analysis or, or are you still engaged with this company and, and might take some of these uh, ideas forward? Um, well, I did work there so I still know people there. It is a real life situation and it's current. Um, I'm not involved with the company. So for instance, I'm not doing any projects with them, but following the, the philosophy of knowledge management, there's always something to learn and knowledge to be gained. Um, and whether someone wants to find out who this company is um, and then sell it to them, you're very welcome. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty sure otherwise, I know who it is. <laughs> Pardon? I'm pretty sure I know who it is because I've got a, a, a my, my personal financial advisor used to work at, at what I think this company is. But <laughs> um, well, a few of them have got common problems, yeah, so that's, that's, you know, or similar yeah. problems. Um, so yeah, but as as a team of crack consultants um, and knowledge management experts, um, and the knowledge management experts. So there's some feedback. Um, Jim, you might want to, or anyone else, you might want to go back on mute. It's not that I don't want to hear from you. It's, <laughs> it's just to prevent feedback. Thank I you. If, I think Maida came off mute. Maida, did you have a question or? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Oh, you're fine. Okay. Okay. Um, so looking at the strategic priorities, uh, advising the senior management team of, of now put key risks because key is something is, is, it's a word that's bandied around a lot, but it's something more than you put in the door to walk through it. Um, so rather than being a piece of metal, it's, this is about setting priorities because when you've got everything going on, where do you start? And also, but bearing in mind the potential business impact of intervening, in your area of choice, but managing the, the hopefully lesser impact of leaving some other issues for, for a while, or being able to transfer knowledge and experience from one area to another. Um, they want to save money, so focus areas for cost savings and efficiency gains, and then potentially what they're gonna do about it, so a roadmap. And so then remind me, Hillary, 
when we send them off into breakouts, I think you and I had prepared a different question for each of the three rounds, right? Um, I can't remember that. Okay. So I think what we, so that was an option. Um, but I think what we did is we agreed to leave it open to the community. Okay. To our team of crack consultants. And what we can do is have the first round just generally talking about the bank situation as such. Okay. Um, so then we can review the strategic ob objectives and, and what, the priority should be the key risks and impact. And then we can go into the challenges. So, and then look at cost savings and efficiency gains with a view to um, recommending a roadmap. Sounds good. <clears throat> so are John, we- Question, yes. John, we're gonna lose this uh, shared screen once we go into our groups, correct? Correct. And so I was had the exact same question. Um, is it okay, uh, Hillary, if I post it in the chat for everybody to have a copy of the file or, or should people just take a photo of it? Or what do you think? You're very welcome to put it in the chat. Okay. Um, what I suggest is, is um, or, or John, you and I can go into two separate groups and we, we can both share the screens and, and so, yeah. so one person can, because there's three breakout groups, uh, one person could take the case study with them and then you and I can also both share it. Does that help? Works for me, yeah. Yeah. I like having my own copy because that way I can scroll where I wish. <laughs> well, I threw it in chat, so hopefully that, it's just a Word document, so if that opens yeah, got it. Up, yeah. that yeah. should work. So, Okay, so then I've got three groups ready. So it's about four to five people per group. And remind me one more time, Hillary. it's looking at these four bullet points at the bottom, right? Yeah, so start with the company overall and its business situation and, and what that means to you from knowledge from a knowledge management standpoint. Look at the strategic objectives and then also be thinking of some responses from a knowledge management standpoint and then look at the challenges. So, um, and what solutions might be and a potential roadmap from a knowledge management standpoint. Gotcha. And I think uh, time-wise, we're still good for, for 15 minutes per breakout, so. Yeah, excuse me, I have to plug in. Sure, sure. I'll, uh, I'll click the button, let me make sure I've got all my settings correctly here. And it should invite you, it should actually automatically send you into your rooms. Um, I will do a 60 second countdown at the end. So what I'll do is I'll broadcast a message with a five minute warning and then Zoom is gonna do the 60 second countdown um, in the last minute. So let me stop recording so there's no more recording.